for this example, we're going to be looking every single year at which stocks have just joined the top 10. And then we're going to look at the returns pre and post joining the top 10. So you can look at this line down the middle. My line's nowhere near as straight as the one that's on there. Uh, this is the demarcation line. This is the first year that these companies join the top 10. And then the bars on either side of that are the average of the annualized compound returns for these stocks in these periods pre and post joining the top 10. So for example, if I look at minus three years, this is the three year period leading up to when these companies first join the top 10. Now I should be careful to note here that this is an excess return. This is an annualized return in excess of the stock market. So when we point to this 24% here, so that's the annualized compound return on average for these companies in the three year period before they join the top 10, that's 24% more than the market. So if I talk about the annualized compound return for the U.S. market, just using the Fama French Total Market Index, going back to the 20s, it's about 10% per year, just under. So you're talking about adding that to that 10% effectively. If you're talking about what to expect going forward after the company has reached the mountaintop, they're in that top 10 already, then the question is, what will they deliver once they are entrenched as a dominant company? And there you get a little bit of a different story. If I look at the average annualized excess returns after joining the top 10, not nearly as impressive. So over the next three years, just slightly above the market, once you get to the five year and 10 year marks, the average annualized excess returns are actually negative. So they're underperforming the overall market. Uh, but I think it is a reminder that things can change in the market, that what is highly innovative today is old news and a few years from now, uh, but what continues to be a great staple for investors is, is just broad diversification. You know, you don't know what is going to be the next Apple or the next Microsoft. And that's why investors are best served by having a broad diversification where they hold lots of these different types of companies.